Welcome, friends, to Breakfast in the Ruins, a Michael Moorcock flavoured podcast. Moorcock's connection with the rock scene is well documented and known, particularly, of course, with space rockers Hawkwind, but perhaps not so well known as the brace of Hawkwind post apocalyptic fantasy crossover novels penned by Michael Butterworth in the 70s at Mike's suggestion. Originally projected to be the first of a trilogy, Time of the Hawk Lords was published by Starbucks in 1976, and the sequel, Queens of Deliria, followed in 1977. Sadly, the third instalment never appeared, other than in a slightly different and difficult to obtain form based upon an initial outline by Butterworth but not completed by him, and they were never widely republished in English until 2021, and until a few years ago I had no idea of their existence. Was it because there were missteps bound for obscurity? They certainly got something of a critical drubbing from the hip press that was already queuing up by the mid-70s to crap on anything psychedelic or hippie-ish. Were they just misunderstood? Moorcock was still a big seller in the 70s, and it could be argued he was at the height of his power, with the condition of Muzak winning the Guardian Fiction Prize in 1977, and on the Star Books edition, his name is emblazoned across the top in a slightly larger font than Butterworth's. But how did they come about in the first place? Fortunately, the recent 2021 Apex edition sheds some light in its introduction. The short version being that Moorcock signed a three-book deal with Starbucks, but found himself overcommitted, so he offered the opportunity to Michael Butterworth, a short story contributor and occasional editor for New Worlds magazine. Coming off the back of a divorce and being a single dad, Butterworth took him up on the offer and wrote the novel Time of the Hawk Lords, based upon the simple prompt, Hawkwind rocking in the ruins of London. It was Butterworth's first novel, and, to summarise the excellent introduction to that Apex edition, which I can heartily recommend despite some misgivings about the cover, he went on to engage in an intense couple of years writing books at a tremendous pace, including Time of the Hawk Lords, Queens of Deliria, and half a dozen Space 1999 novelizations, a couple of which I've had kicking around on my shelf since the 80s, before deciding writing sci-fi and fantasy wasn't really for him, so he knocked it on the head, and went off to found Savoy Books with David Britton, co-authoring Lord Horror along the way. And that story itself, and the story of Savoy more broadly, is worthy of several podcasts. So really, with this kind of backstory and heritage, how can this book be so obscure and largely forgotten outside of hardcore Hawkwind fan circles, or people that happened to pick it up in a second-hand bookshop because it had Moorcock on the cover? It surely deserves reappraisal. In his introduction to the Apex edition, Butterworth, who took the negative critical reception very much to heart back in the 70s, said, Only one mainstream critic, writing in time out, bothered to read the book properly and review it for what it was. He captured my intentions. As it is only short, I will quote Steve Pinder's review in full. A strange novel, on the face of it, a science fiction story along the normal lines, yet the underlying themes of the battle between the music of Hawkwind and the plastic pop that is the weapon of the Dark Forces as well as the claustrophobic feel of the ever-impending end, single it out. The book is redolent with the Ladbroke Grove feel of Moorcock's Jerry Cornelius works, the tackiness of the flower power that he clings to, yet this is more doom-laden and pessimistic. Certainly, if you read it, play Ellie Harquand at top volume. It is the only way to really understand. Time out, October 22nd to 28th, 1976. I clung on to this. Only gradually did I come to see that these voices, greatly exaggerated by their volume, appearing as they did in the national press, were not entirely representative of how the book was being received. There were others more in line with Steve Pinder's, and these were from the legion of the novel's many readers. Reviewers for the various Hawkwind fan sites, if at times critical of a young author's attempts at the novel, also mostly get the books. I think now that the novels weren't that badly reviewed. I didn't write them for the critics, and if some readers perceive them as a little quaint... Provided they take enjoyment from them, that is okay by me. Well, as is generally the case with this podcast, we need to find out what this is all about for ourselves. And when I thought about looking at this book, the first guest that crossed my mind that would have some insight and perhaps be prepared to spend time with me and Derry and Tom's gassing about it was our friend Joe Banks, author of Hawkwind, Days of the Underground, Radical Escapism in the Age of Paranoia. Unfortunately, Joe agreed to join me for a third time. So, put the needle gun aside for now, power up some awesome tunes to counter the squares and repel the ghosts of the old world, and come with us to a ruined Britain desperately in need of space rock, and some speed, probably, in The Time of the Hawk Lords. <laughs> uh, 
we're, we're, we're kicking off unusually, or is it usual? I don't know. Um, we're kicking off in Derry and Tom's. Joe Banks is back. Welcome back, Joe. Hi there. Great to be back. Joe, of course, writer, journalist, uh, writer of Days of the Underground, the, uh, mm-hmm. the Hawkwind book, which is quite relevant on this occasion because, of course, we're covering this book, The Time of the Hawk Lords, and it's written by Michael Butterworth. And you actually interviewed Michael Butterworth for that book, didn't you? I did, yeah. Um, I, inter- <laughs> I interviewed a lot of people for the book, but... Um... Yeah, I interviewed him about it because um, I think that a lot of people still don't even know about the existence of this book, or I'm guessing. Mm. Um, but mm. it's actually quite, I think it's quite important. It was quite important for me in terms of my discovery of Hawkwind because bizarrely enough, within, uh, well, I, I had discovered uh, a copy of Space Ritual in the local record library when I was 14. And this was all coinciding around the same time when I was actually getting into Moorcock novels for the first time and they had a, a wire rack of paperbacks in the library so I was working my way through them and then at some point it occurred to me oh I wonder if they've got any in the hardback section and mm. I went along and they had a few and one of them <laughs> bizarrely enough was Time of the Hawk Lords um, and uh, it was uh, it, it was odd to say the least because as I said I mean these you know Hawkwind and Moorcock were coinciding at the same time but I thought is this normal do bands usually have books written about them like this? And mm. then it was like, who's this Butterworth guy? Um, but anyway, yeah, sorry, <laughs> that's the original question. Uh, I did speak to, to Michael Butterworth at, at some length about um, about this book, and uh, he was he was pretty interesting. Yeah, well, I, I, might, I might grill you on that a little bit, but just before mm. I started um, recording, you did ask me the can that I was cracking open, and this is mm-hmm. uh, an Arbar Petit de Genoa Session Breakfast Stout. Who was it by? Craig. Oh, I suppose it's by Arbor. That's yeah, that gives the game away, doesn't it? It's by Arbor. What, what it's is a, a breakfast stout? Well, I don't know, but it's it's a pint can of four point seven percent breakfast stout, and I don't know if they're just pulling people's legs saying this is sort of stout that you drink for breakfast. But if mm. they are, I'm I'm ruining the game by having it at eight o'clock in the evening rather than for breakfast. So yeah, it's it's, it's, it's weird because I, I bought my um bought my wife a a, a kind of box of a non-alcoholic lager for Christmas, like a selection mm. pack. And um, one of the things she was drinking, it was called toast, and it was allegedly made from surplus bread. And ah, that's so it. Breakfast, breakfast stout makes me wonder whether it's like, you know, kind of eggs and bacon and a bit of toast maybe. Or who knows? Yeah, about three years ago, me and Loz drank some stouts on one of the one of the episodes, and one of them was made from upcycled cocoa pops, which puzzled me that's... at the time. And another one was made from old bread. Yeah, and they're actually mm. quite nice as well. Mm. What are you slurping on there? Oh, so this is a bottle of, of Madri. Uh, can you see that? Which is this weird beer yes. that seems to have literally, within you know the past year, it's kind of everywhere suddenly. It's on all the pumps in the pubs, well, and a lot of the pumps, and yeah. it's um, you know it's just from the supermarket, and it's it's not it's just like basically like an Australia or something, but. It's just suddenly appeared yeah. out of nowhere for a year, and now it's everywhere. So I don't know. It's obviously yeah, my, got a big brewery behind it. Funnily enough, is like um, what um, Madri seems to be replacing, which is beer Moretti, which someone brought round at Christmas, which yeah, isn't yeah. generally something I drink. But we're at the tail end of all our Christmas booze, and my only mm. real choice is this evening, unless I was going to dive into the cupboard and pull out a bottle of chartreuse or something stupid like that. And I'm, <laughs> I'm at work tomorrow, so I'm not going to do that. Uh, was to uh, just have a rake around and either drink snowballs because I've got a bottle of Advoca that I haven't opened yet, <laughs> or or just have the tail end beers and this is what we've got. Yeah, I've seen the Madri on pump, but I've never actually tried mm. it. But of course, the yeah. labels are very similar. On my beer Moretti label, I've got like an old Italian gentleman. Yeah, so this has got like, like a, a kind of can a, you a see nice it's a, a Spanish hipster in a in a check yeah. waistcoat and matching cap, and he has a small anchor tattoo on his neck as well, which is a Particularly yeah. nice touch. And, and a hipster well-crafted hipster everywhere. beard. Mm. It's very hipsterish, yeah. Well, okay, so we're not really pushing the boat out with any 30% <laughs> <Sorry>. imperial <laughs> parses or anything, but sure, you know what? Interested we've got a drink. In this at all. Yeah. All right. We've got yeah. a drink to accompany us along the way. Mm. Uh, so, yeah, Michael Butterworth, the only reason I'd ever heard of him in the first place is because from an earlier age, I'd come across Space 1999 novelizations, mm-hmm. of, of which he did quite a few in a rapid splurge. Apparently over like an eighteen month period, and he only had three weeks to write them, and he he, he was never able to see episodes, and all he had was rough shooting scripts, had the scripts to work from. 
Yeah. 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 So reading them as a Space 1999 fan, they're actually quite interesting because there are notable differences. But I'd never, other than that, I'd never come across him. And I'd never come across this book until I started reading about Savoy when I found out a little bit more about Butterworth and his work Mm -hmm. with David Britton. And additionally, this book I didn't even know existed until my mate Yaki got me it for my birthday about five years ago. And it was it was a real surprise to me, and yeah. it was like, and I had the same kind of reaction. It was like, what a Hawkwind book, a book where Hawkwind is some kind of fantasy sci fi hero. Really, now having read it, this is what the Spice World movie should have been if they had the balls. <laughs> I, I would have completely bought into that. But it is uh, an incredibly interesting book. But of course, Butterworth, a really interesting guy as well, part of that early New World. Um, group of authors worked on New World. I think he might have done some editing on New World as well. Um, yeah, I think he maybe been involved. So he he started off. He was a kind of young guy. Um, I think his first story was published in New Worlds when he was nineteen, like nineteen sixty six. Mm. And he he was kind of writing, you know, kind of little new wave sci fi stories, and it obviously got picked up by Moorcock. And at one point, I think Ballard actually took him under his wing a little bit as well mm. and, and kind of worked with him. Um, but yeah, so he was, he also did poetry. Um, he was published in various other kind of fanzines, kind of literary kind of magazines as well around this time. And he's, he was based in Manchester, uh, which is where he comes from. Um, but he did, I think, lived in Labrook Grove towards the end of the 60s for a bit. Mm. And the way. <laughs> This novel came about. If you want to, if we, if we want to go into the explanation, um, let's do it. Okay, let's do it. So, at some point, Michael Moorcock had pitched the idea of a rock and roll trilogy to a guy called Piers Dudgeon, who was the guy who ran um, Star Books, and Star uh, was a subsidiary of W. H. Allen uh, Publishers, and they're the same people who did Target. So Star and Target, which are the Doctor Who books came out on, were, were kind of comparable. And so at some point, Moorcock, um, who obviously knew everybody, had pitched to Piers Dudgeon this idea of a, a rock and roll sci-fi trilogy uh, featuring mm-hmm. Hawkwind. And um, at some point, you know, Star said, yeah, great. OK, let's go for it. And at that point, Moorcock was suddenly like, oh, shit. Um, he completely <laughs> kind of overcommitted himself. He was doing 100 other things at the same time. So he didn't have any time to write them. And bear in mind, this was probably end of 74, maybe, possibly start of 75. And it's at the point where Moorcock is perhaps having ideas of becoming a slightly more literary author, shall we say, or wanting to be perceived mm. a bit more as a kind of literary author rather than the, the kind of sword and sorcery guy that he was mainly perceived of at the time. So anyway, so um, he'd agreed to do the books. He said, yes, um, how can he do them? And he basically asked Michael Butterworth if he could do them. Um, Michael Butterworth hadn't written any novels at this point. As I said, he'd, he'd done short stories, but he hadn't written any novels. Uh, and he, I think, had recently divorced from his wife uh, and had custody of the two kids. So he was a single father with two young children, probably quite unusual in the, at that time in the 70s. Uh, and he was like, you know, desperate for any way to support himself. And so he said, yeah, absolutely. Mm-hmm. That's that's of course. Yeah. Yeah, I'll write them. He didn't really know anything. Well, he, he obviously knew of Hawkwind, but he didn't really know that much about them at the time. So there was a rapid kind of learning curve, if you like, to kind of come up to speed uh, with with them and the whole mythology, the whole mythos. And in terms of what Michael Moorcock left him, it was literally one line, which was uh, Hawkwind rocking in the ruins of London. And that was the only direction that he had. I actually did read recently another interview with Moorcock where he claims to have written the first page, but right. that's, you know, it's certainly no more than that. Um, mm. So, yeah, so basically kind of Butterworth has to, you know, come up with this 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 kind of story from, from whatever mm. source material is available to him. Mm. And obviously it's Hawkwind and their music and their songs, but there's also... Uh, which turned out to be a big inspiration is the Sonic Assassins comic strip that appeared in Friends magazine in November 71. And when I say comic strip, it's actually, it was just like a two pager, which Moorcock had written 
and Jim Cawthorn had illustrated, who mm-hmm. was one of Moorcock's kind of mates and one of his favorite illustrators, I'm sure you know. And um, yeah. and they had done this kind of two page strip, which got published in Friends magazine, which is one of the big underground magazines. Uh, and it it was actually a very big, long advert for In Search of Space, which had just come out. Mm-hmm. But um, the the comic strip, basically, it's the idea um, of I think it's Void City, Void City in um, the comic strip is under attack. It's attacked by the kind of forces of darkness, which in this case is the BBC, which <laughs> basically, um, which is, stands for Black Burst Bomber Command and led by a character called Tony Blackburst. I don't know who Tony Blackburst <laughs> could possibly be. And there's the scenes of them kind of flying in with their, their music. Uh, flying in these kind of planes and they the planes are playing music but it's all like terrible you know kind of stuff like uh i mean a, a lot of the lyrics i had to kind of really dig to find out what they were because they're quite obscure songs now but the, the ones that we would know are things like frank sinatra's uh, my way and um is there any actually there's a jonathan king song as well um he did a reggae pastiche which is just absolutely vile Johnny mm. Reggae, that's right, uh, and that's that's. And anyway, so so the 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 denizens of Void City, who is basically you know the hipsters, uh, or the hip, uh, you know, kind of the people of Labrook Grove, are being bombarded by the the psychic pollution of uh, the BBC's music, and they have to have Hawkwind come along, and and save them. The Hawk come along, and they there's a scene where they're you know they've got their guitars and and, and their instruments, and they're kind of pointing them at the sky as though they were guns. And they're kind of mm. playing their music to ward off the bad vibes of the BBC, and um, and 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 you know, and then the thing ends. So, you know, it's, it, it, I mean, it's fabulously illustrated. I mean, it, it's 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 wonderful. I mean, it's a fairly inconsequential story, but from that, um, Butterworth took this idea of kind of good vibes and bad vibes music, which is kind of central to 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 kind of how Time of the Hawk Lords works and what it's about. Uh, and so that was his initial inspiration. And this is where you get things like the music guns and stuff like that. Yeah, well, I think Tony Blackburn is actually mentioned at one point in this. I think it's the Saudi Oil Brigade when they're preparing their music to combat yeah. the sonic waves of Hawkwind. The Tony Blackburn radio show, I'm sure, is referenced. Um, but there's all sorts the, of other music referenced as well as, as, as it, like the bad vibe music, which we'll, bad vibe I'm music, sure yeah. we'll talk about. Yeah, it's yeah, Tony Blackburn. It's actually it's it's specifically a song of this called Chop Chop. Now I've got no mm. idea what this is, but you know, in those days the DJs would always be. I think he just put out quite a few singles. I think he was actually quite popular. Yeah. Um, but yeah, exactly. So he he kind of pops up there, which of course, as I kind of say in the book, is actually pretty ironic because it's because he starts playing Silver Machine quite a lot when it comes out that Silver Machine becomes a hit. So this guy who they've been slagging off the year before was kind of quite important in <laughs> actually breaking them ultimately but anyway yeah i mean you know let's 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 actually talk about this book a little bit mm-hmm. um i mean it kicks off the, there's a legend and it says and in the future of time the prophecy must be fulfilled and the hawk lord shall return to smite the land and the dark forces shall be scourged the cities raised and made into parks peace shall come to everyone for is it not written that the sword is the key to heaven and hell hmm Another mm-hmm. leaf, we get the Hawkcraft Inventory. And it says, at the time of the events presented in this book, the ever-changing crew of Hawkwind spacecraft are, and then we get their uh, sort of pseudonyms. The pseudonyms, so we've got yeah. Ba- yeah. We've got Baron Brock, which is David Brock. We've got the Thunder Rider, Nick Turner. Count yeah. Motorhead, Lemmy. Lord, uh, but is very rarely ever referred to as Count Motorhead in the book. All the other characters tend to be referred to by their... their um, nicknames but yeah lem is generally just referred to as lemmy i mean lemmy is a nickname in itself he couldn't really better it lord rudolph the black which is paul rudolph the Houndmaster, simon king the sonic prince simon house stacia the earth mother well that speaks for itself mm. astral al which is one of my favorites which is alan powell liquid len jonathan smeaton captain calvert which is bob calvert moorlock the acid sorcerer who, uh, who plays uh, uh, a role in this book? Important role. Actonium Doug, which is mm. Doug Smith, the manager. That's my other favourite. I, I want to be called Actonian Andy. Might change my name by default. <laughs> so, so he's Actonium Doug because because he comes from he lived he was living in Acton at the time. 
because I used to think, yeah. oh, wow, that's a really fantastic word, but now it's because he lived in Acton. Oh, that's really disappointing. Sorry, I, I know that's, that's a bit deflating. Some kind of rare air fellow. Yeah, <laughs> no, <laughs> it's Acton. Like it's from Acton. All right, mm. fair enough. And it's uh, it's the traditional, actually, the traditional structure of a lot of the Mocop books around the time. It's split into three books. Mm-hmm. The first book being Rocking on the Edge of Time. Well, fine, good kickoff. But so, I mean, essentially, the setup is, and one of the things I absolutely love about this book is it plays really beautifully into one of our occasional obsessions that we've developed over the last couple of years on this podcast. And that's those books from the 60s and 70s that emerged from genre fiction which is the Britain is Fucked book. And this is uh, a really fantastic Mm. Britain is Fucked book. The Mm -hmm. population is tiny. There's been some kind of worldwide apocalypse of some description, which we'll find out a little bit more about as we go along. And as the book is kicking off, Hawkwind are playing a massive gig for, in inverted commas, the children, which is like the book's code for the surviving hippies, Hawkwind fans, Mm -hmm. counterculture people, Basically, anybody who isn't a straight or a reactionary, Mm. they seem to be, or or the middle class whose brains are all now stored in a giant computer, (laughs) which is which is fantastic. We also meet in the first um, opening segments King Trash, who's the the remaining member of the monarchy who's not happy about all the bloody hippies, so he's making his staff's life a misery. We've got the noise from the show making a journalist called. Sex ass. <laughs> I mean, it's it's spelled S E K S A double S. Old name. Sex ass. Sex ass. Uh, but it makes yeah. him p- piss and shit himself. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Which is inconvenient as he's currently trying to investigate the twinny triad sex case. And because we've found out, all we know at this point is he's investigating the twinny triad sex case and he's based somewhere where the entire population of the middle class of England are now stored in a central computer. And after about six hours, Hawkwind run out of steam and they need some downers and rest because they've also got to go and play the New World show. So I'm going to read a little bit from the Yellow Van Commune. So they're all knackered. They're all on the downers. It says, The journey to the Yellow Van Commune in Notting Hill Gate, where Hawkwind had their base, was long and straining. The Mercedes edged its way through a mass of seemingly disjointed limbs and faces that peered in and smiled and waved. The congestion grew worse as they travelled further out from the compound into the sprawling minicity of tents and shelters. Thunder Rider winced unpleasantly at the sights. The apparent cheerfulness on the faces outside was a pretense. Behind each mask was a terrified, panic-stricken gaze that stabbed him to the core. They were desperate for Hawkwind to return, but there was no way he could help until after dark, when they'd rested. No one knew what was causing the bad effects. No one guessed at the start that the concert would have become anything other than a good, mindless freakout to dispel bad vibrations. They noticed the strange but beautiful high effect that the music had, but they had not discovered the full extent of its power until he had tried to stop playing and rested up for a short ten-minute breather. The effects had been instant, like the withdrawal symptoms from a highly addictive drug. At last the grimy, lemon-coloured Mercedes broke free of the clinging crowds, and though speeding along the venues forged out of the wreckage of stilled cars and other vehicles that choked the Knightsbridge Road, and most of the parts of London. Here and there some of the more adventurous children had set up a shop or home, trying to breathe back life into the great city. Most of the few remaining habitable buildings were now in fact occupied. In parts, the pavements were even starting to look familiarly crowded again especially in the gate itself and on the Portobello Road where the commune was situated. There were other pockets of indigenous life also remaining in London, called simply the Others by the Children. They belonged to the older orders, the breed of men who had brought the world to its present sorry condition. Some of them were dressed in uniform and carried guns to protect themselves and their property from others less privileged, but they were few in numbers and rarely seen. Higgy brought the van to an abrupt halt outside number 271 Portobello Road, the Yellow Van Commune. The Commune was so named in order of the group's first yellow van back in the late 60s, the decrepit vehicle which in those early days had served literally as home for most members. The group had moved in during the desperate period of fighting and dying, which had taken place after the British Army had failed to bring back law and order, and after their own homes had been burnt to the ground to provide night illumination for the insane mobs that had roamed the streets, mindlessly murdering and looting. It was situated adjacent to the burnt-out shell of the legendary Mountain Grill restaurant, 
the supplier of good, plentiful food to many a starving freak who roamed the inhuman streets of the period. For some unaccountable reason, 271 had always attracted people of a certain fighting kind who pledged their life to revolutionary causes. The previous occupants had been outlaw publishers of underground pamphlets, friends of Hawkwind who had been hideously killed by marauding gangs of Puritan vigilantes. The entrance door was painted in Barney's typical swelling colours and designs, as was every square centimetre of exterior brickwork up to the roof. It led into a long, dark hall, cluttered with dusty relics of the past, and decorated with distorted pictures of cars and long-dead people painted onto the walls. The interior of the house has remained more or less as they found it, most of its effects belonging to the luckless publishers. The walls were lined with old mirrors and hangings from different periods, collected years before from the junk stalls that once lined the streets outside with thriving business life. The common room, where the group usually slept and relaxed, contained a similar, odd mixture of second-hand items. A long green dusty couch, a scarred wooden chest of drawers, a creaking wicker basket chair, a harmonium, a bed, and on the floor several giant cushions and striped mattresses, as well as innumerable smaller items of curiosity. The tired band climbed out of the van and clomped upstairs, oblivious of the small group of children who had gathered to watch their return. They threw themselves down on the first soft surfaces that presented themselves, but sleep was hard coming. Almost immediately, the terrifying sickness started to gnaw its way up from under the tiredness. It screwed up their stomachs and slid racking pains into their heads, making them long for the hour when their bodies would be rested, and once more they could pick up their instruments and play. Eventually, with the help of downers procured by Higgy, they managed to sink into a turbulent, delirious kind of release. I love that. That actually reminds me of all the places I used to hang out when I was 19. Absolute shitholes with crappy old furniture and people just laying around in heaps for days on end. I love it. It makes me feel really quite... Uh, I don't think it makes me feel like I want to be back there because I like my modern luxuries too much, but it does It does make me pine a little bit for the early days of, of just being a bum and laying around people's houses for days on end, getting up to no good. Yeah. Mm. But Thunder Rider is the first of the band to work, and we do get a lovely little passage. And Thunder Rider opened his eyes to the weird glow of firelight coming through the holes in the curtains. Though he had been worn out, he had an uneasy sleep due to the withdrawal depression. He had experienced frightening dreams and unnerving physical pains and shakes. Not wanting to wake and face them properly, he tried to let himself drift off again. But a sudden, sharp cracking came at the window pane. Then he heard the voices of the children outside and realised they had woken him up. They were reminding Hawkwind of their pledge. Stiffly, he arose and went to the window. He pulled back the curtains and peered out at the night scene. A large crowd of children had gathered. They'd built a roaring, crackling fire in the centre of the street. Behind the derelict shop fronts opposite him, the intense, primitive blackness of the night was waiting, pressing in on the garish assembly. He felt a mournful excitement build up inside him as he watched. Most of the children were looking at the window and he waved to let them know he had seen them. He turned away to survey the silent, sleeping forms jumbled frozen on the floor in the room. The scene in here looked deceptively normal. It could still be 1976. Only the sounds and lights coming from outside suggested otherwise. He debated whether to work them, then decided to let them sleep on a few moments longer. They looked so peaceful. Hawkwind had undergone so many changes. They'd come so far, lived through so many periods. They'd all come through and survived the last few months intact, except for one member, Actonium Doug Smith. The still shape of their ex-manager was sprawled sadly on a mattress, just as it had been for days, too morose to care. He slept with Clarence, his shaggy-haired old English sheepdog, surrounded by a litter of cans and bottles. Ever since the old world had ended, he had made no attempt to adapt and only slipped further into depression. Thunder Rider guessed, sadly, that it was because there was no management role left for him to play. He wended his way into the bathroom, switching on the battery light as he went. He was still dressed in his silver PVC suit. At close quarters, it didn't look so good. He had ripped holes in it in several places for ventilation. Elsewhere, the aluminium was starting to rub off. He decided to change into something more casual for the party. When he emerged 20 minutes later, he was dressed in faded denims and sweatshirt, wearing soft, brown, low-heeled boots and a wide, pewter-coloured belt. The belt was fastened impressively with twin interlocking bison heads, a piece of unusual gear he had once picked up from an alternative leather craft shop in Belsize Park. Round his neck he wore a silver medallion he had sworn to wear forever, the parting love gift of a Mexican girl 
he met on an old tour. On his fingers, he wore an assortment of rings like controls that flashed as he moved. He felt much better, apart from the sick feeling in his head and stomach, which wouldn't go away until the music started again. He went to wake the others. I love all this stuff. I can feel the clammy, sweaty sense of it all. All that post-speed, acid, upper-down attention that Mm. saturates you after that kind of experience. But the reason I wanted to read this is because this is the most grounded part of the novel. (laughs) And I think from here, it all gets increasingly wacky (laughs) and quite odd. But I I do love it. I love, And actually, I really like Michael Butterworth's writing Mm -hmm. and also the fact that he throws in some sartorial descriptions there as well, which Mm -hmm. is always part of the fun of reading a Mercop book. Yeah, Mm -hmm. I mean, he's, he's, he's a pretty good writer, actually. I mean, to say that this was his first novel... Uh, I mean, he did have, I think he had a year to write it, which is still not a great deal mm. of time, but, you know, kind of pretty good. And um, I, I think it's not too bad. I mean, you know, this this book kind of has a reputation for just being, you know, completely out there. I and mean, it's 250 pages as well. It's not like a kind of knockoff kind of, you know, 130 job yeah. from New English Library or whatever. I mean, it's like actually quite a serious, serious length novel, just for me anyway. Um, yeah. But it's 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 pretty good. I mean, you know... C- it's it's kind of crazy, but it's 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 quite well written, and it's it's written seriously as well, which is the thing I, I kind mm. of um, observed. I mean, when I spoke to Mike, I mean, he said that some of it was meant to be kind of slightly played for laughs, but he kind of felt that that was that was kind of lost. And actually, it's quite a serious tone to it, even even though it is a completely ridiculous story. There is definitely some playful stuff in there. Mm. Uh, I'll comment on some of that as as we go along. N- not with you know, quite apart from the descriptions of the music that the straights play in order to re- repel the waves of Hawkwind, which is always amusing. But there is some playful stuff. There's a bit later on where Moorlock the sorcerer kind of wanders off into the rubble of London to call out the Dark Lord. There's a bit where he gives this massive piece of exposition at Blenheim Crescent about the mythology behind the Hawk Lords, and it does sound very much like Michael Butterworth almost pastiching <laughs> You know, Murkocky and multiverse yeah, yeah. law. It, mm. it is it is very amusing, and there's even a bit at the end where the band kind of recap the law, but they can't even be asked to get it right, which I absolutely love. They <laughs> laughed out loud, and that's like the, the, the second couple of pages. But it's gig time again. They await the Lord of Light, aka Liquid Lens, signal that the psychedelic light show signifying the arrival of the Hawkwind spacecraft in inverted commas is beginning, so they can get cracking again. Unfortunately, the crowd is well oiled because uh, the manager managed to find a 5,000-gallon tanker of bass, bitter, <laughs> which, which is flat as a fart, flat, flat, but yeah. it's fine because the, the break into it and everybody drinks flat bitter. And as the show continues, we get this nice series of short vignettes illustrating the impact the gig is having worldwide, um, from India to the Arctic to various different places, and all these people start to feel the emanations coming from London from or aka the Earth City, and mm. start to head for London. Now, at this point, I'm thinking, is is this going to kind of pay off the, the all these people descending on London? It sort of doesn't really. They do all turn up at the end, but it doesn't really have any impact on anything. No. But we then get the introduction, really, of probably the antagonist, the main antagonist of this book, which is Colonel Memphis Memphis of British Army's Saudi Oil Brigade, the SOBs, <laughs> and he's bristling at the idea of hippies desecrating London's parks. And we get this brilliant description of his men managing to tune into some Bay City Rollers. I think this is the Tony Blackburn bit. They're tuning into a, a radio station that's playing the Bay City Rollers that eases the effects of the sonic waves from the Hawkwind gig so they can have a break from wearing sanitary pants. <laughs> <laughs> because the sonic waves from Hawkwind are also making them piss and shit themselves lose control of their bowels <laughs> yeah yeah it's wonderful it's wonderful so hawkwind are playing these 10 hour sessions on heroic amounts of speed with breaks for sleep and downers but after eight days they're running out of downers but they realize only live music is staving off the mysterious waves of paranoia that are bringing the air flow described at one point as threatening image warfare uh, later described as uh, the death generator mm-hmm. or the death ray, alternatively. It's it's all great stuff, and there's there's so much going on with people from across the world heading to Britain, and it's it has kind of similarities to the entropy that kicks in at the end of the final program with already the Jerry Cornelius novels with the, the you know the fall of civilization. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. All these people 
they realise that their music is being amplified by a piece of equipment called the Delatron, which is a product of Del Detmar, who isn't around anymore. I must say, I expected Del Detmar to turn up later on in the book Lovely, yeah. as some kind of deus ex machina to save the day, but mm. it doesn't. Someone else does, though, as we'll find out. Now, King Trash, by now, has a personal bog <laughs> attached permanently to his arse, which I thought was wonderful. But he sends his chief scientist, Hot Plate, to infiltrate the yellow van and obtain the Delatron. Actually, he ends up going native, and uh, he, he becomes essentially one of the gang does hot plate. But once again, some rather unusual names. I'm sure he had a, a lot of fun coming up with these things. And Colonel Mephis's SOB garrison decides to set off from Saudi Arabia to take down the Delatron rays of Hawkwind. The convoy, replete with its own DJ, playing pop music to protect them from the sonic attack. On this occasion, Mary Had a Little Lamb by Paul McCartney and Wings. Oh, I've carefully itemised all these. I don't think I've ever heard Mary as a little no, I haven't, like Paul I haven't. And, and, and Wings, but I'm going to have to try and Are you thinking of, thinking of a playlist? Playlist to go I with think we're going to have to, aren't yeah. we? We're going to have to put together a straight playlist mm. that consists of all these things. As it happens, I'm thinking of all these things too late, but I'll have time to do these things. But it was only a couple of days ago I found out through Butterworth's website that there have been some... Re, re, um, re-releases, revised editions released in hardback mm. than the first one uh, so there's this and Queens of Deliria and the first one has actually got a, a foreword, an introduction mm-hmm. by Michael Butterworth so I ordered them but you can only get them from bloody Germany mm-hmm. so they haven't arrived yet for whatever reason, you can't find them or, get, or order them yeah. from this country, Don't which is, yeah. it is weird. Yeah. anyway, Actodium Doug is on a major downer so Stacia and Thunder Rider go to see the only person they think can help, who turns out to be Moorlock, the Acid Sorcerer, whose alternative describes as Moorlock or just simply the Moorlock. Because this is a, a longer book than we're normally tending to do on this podcast, I'm rattling through things quite quickly, <laughs> but let's have a look at the Watcher. Long before the final collapse, the Moorlock had known what would happen to humanity. His peculiar sensitivity had seen in advance the outcome of the recklessness and the greed. He had seen the cities collapsing and the men running like frightened ants across the wasted deserts. He had seen the bombs dropping. He had seen the pesticides and the smokes gradually maim and destroy. He had seen the children of the future lying battered and dead in their cots. He had tried to warn of the silent holocaust and the bitter fighting and rioting as the survivors fought for control of the last remaining pieces of greenery. He had written books about it. He had spoken on television about it. He had made a film about it. Finally, he had sung about it. He had formed his own group the deep fix, and played at concerts and outdoor festivals, but no one had listened. The game of death had blindly continued. Gradually, the prophecies had come true, prophecies that not only he predicted, but also the ancient books of law. Disillusioned and scornful of his selfish fellow man, he had decided that the outside world and all it contained was no more than a grisly comic joke, perpetuated by sick-minded gods. He built a thick protective shell around him and locked himself away, For months he brooded, absorbing the knowledge from the books. Even inside the electronic fortress he was unable to escape the events outside. Man's follies haunted him. He was of the same race, he could never escape. Many times he had almost given up, and opened the doors to the marauding gangs and the self-styled militia. But he had held out. Now, after the final death, they had come in from outside to tell him that a new race of man was being born out of the ruins. Now they were telling him that the whole rotten show was trying to start all over again. Now he stared through the shadows of his cell at the two intent figures sitting on the sofa opposite him. They were man and woman. They were Stacia and Thunder Rider. They were part of the new men he had dared not belong to. Finally he spoke. You've come at the right time, he told them. I'll help you. Now it refers to his electronic fortress. We found out later on that his electronic fortress is a computer called Victoria, who he has a strangely saucy relationship with. Mm. (laughs) Although we never quite find out the details behind that. But... Actonium Doug comes round anyway, just in time for Hot Plate, who, as we said, has gone native because King Trash is a tool. They figure out that playing records through a Delatron has the same effect, but with limited range compared to live music. So they're set to create in many Delatrons to create Delatron Hawkwind broadcasting towers around London to combat the mysterious ray. And there we go. That's the end of book one. Well, we got through that in good time, I thought. Yeah. In book two we find out a little bit more about the journalist Sexass, 
who's still in bed investigating the 20 triad sex affair. And we find out something a little bit more about what's exactly going on with all of this computer business and the middle class. There's moodily sex ass, the press reporter at control. Press reporter at control. We find out what the press are later on as well. Sat hunched over his desk, clutching his stomach. His face was drained of blood and his body was visibly shaking. Once again, the day had been claimed by the toilet and the sick bay, and his work was getting badly behind. Thankfully, it was the same for everyone at control since the disgusting hippie music had started up. Why on earth their own guard of soldiers couldn't have stopped it all happening in the first place, he would never know. The opportunities had been there, and now they had mysteriously been lost. The press staff at control, of course, could never leave their purse and take up arms. They could never leave the computer. Too many millions of lives were at stake, minds that, one day, might live corporately again and serve to repopulate the country when the new order emerged. He sighed and belched sickly. It was time to check on the 20 triad case again, and he didn't feel like going in today. What had started out as a revolting case of sex between two deviant ghost minds who lived inside the computer had now turned into one of the most lengthy, difficult assignments of his career. Normally it was fairly easy to track guilty partners down on account of their ostentatious behaviour, but in this instance, the third woman, in, of all the possible terrible things, a triad relationship, had proved extremely hard to catch. She was an expert in mental camouflage, and being the instigator, had to be caught. The other two, a man and another woman, had been kept under observation, but couldn't be brought to justice until they had unwittingly incriminated the third. Sex ass belched miserably again as the nauseating juices in his stomach heaved and bubbled. So, again, we do find a little bit more about this, but the press actually are people who investigate, like morality police, Mm. the activities of the middle class of England who are all living in a virtual reality world inside a computer. Mm. It's fantastic. (laughs) It's it's, it's like the Matrix. Yeah, I mean, I I think in terms of... I mean, I don't know for sure, but in terms of like uh, 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 the idea of cyberspace, this is actually quite early on, 1976, yeah. to be talking about this stuff. You know, it's obviously, you know, before it all kind of kicks off with William Gibson. But, um, but yeah, I actually think this bit is kind of quite interesting. It's kind of slightly ahead of its time. Yeah, it predates the Euromancer by eight years or something. Mm. Mm. You know, the, uh, obviously, you know, we've, fortunately, we don't have people with talking about 20 megabyte hard drives implanted <laughs> into the brain <laughs> things like that so, yeah. so it doesn't date itself in that respect mm. but i do love the idea of, of the fact that the middle class must have all like voluntarily mm. decided to go into this virtual reality world it's, it explains on the next page that there are booths with pasty people in them and actually when it says he didn't want to go in it was because he was too knackered the press actually physically put themselves in these booths put a skull cap on and actually go into this virtual world where they have enhanced powers mm. sort of like the agents in the matrix and they investigate people and we find out later on as well that they actually can record the results of their investigations and record what's going on and then that is fed back into the simulation in the form of kind of daily mail style and bbc style news broadcasts and reports to keep people in line and to keep people moral and upstanding and on the straight and narrow it's pretty fantastic, really. Mm. Mm. And the fact that it's only a throwaway part of this book that probably only occupies probably seven or eight pages at most, mm. because later on one of the Hartwin gang do go in and have yep. an adventure yep. in, in the simulation, which is, uh, which is pretty entertaining. But it's great. So Actonium Doug and Hotplate are trying to set up these towers. So Hawkwind and Moorcock, sorry, Hawkwind and the Moorlock, decide to go to Brighton on holiday. <laughs> As you would. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Equipped, however, with sonic pistols that fire concentrated waves of their music so they could try and defend themselves. And, again, this is an absolutely fab chapter with descriptions of the ruined English landscape that are the equal of any other of the British fucked literature that was doing the rounds at the time. I love it. Goes on for quite a few pages. The description of how just terribly affected the the countryside and the townships are, and there's a, there's a good example. Just at the end of page eighty two, it's a really short one. It says, "The outskirts of Brighton came into view, raising their hopes. Here, at least, there ought to be some sort of bringing together of the isolated survivors." 
but they were quickly disillusioned. The buildings were mostly completely burned out or smashed down. The sea looked rank and oily. It heaved rottenly, disgorging a rancid grey sludge onto the beaches. Strangely, the only intact structures were the numerous amusement arcades in the vast fairground complex. It seemed almost as though these had been religiously preserved by the warring sects and gangs who had once terrorised the seaside town. Most probably, they had been used as areas of mutual truce where the protagonists could escape from the tension. Perhaps they had been the privileged leisure grounds of the dominant fighters. Now they were the silent, deserted machinery of ghosts in the wind. And rats. You know, I'm, I might be easily pleased, but I really love stuff like that. And Because, quite apart from anything else, I've got a massive love of run-down seaside mm-hmm. towns. Mm-hmm. I can't get enough of them. And this just makes me want to go to run-down, <laughs> devastated Brighton. I suppose the, the main difference between all those other books at the time and this is that this has Harquin disperse a strange, dark, ghostly shape with waves from their sonic pistols, which results in loads of different Harquin songs mashing up <laughs> to create an incredibly powerful wave that, that disperses this ghost. It's like, it made me realise, why haven't I read this book before a million times, and why hasn't it been made into an animated film? Because it starts to verge on Harquin being almost like the Scooby-Doo gang. Yeah. Yeah. Or an expanded yeah. psychedelic Scooby Doo gang. Yeah. You know, tra- traveling through a wasteland in their uh, in their version of the Mystery Machine. I love it. I absolutely love it. Quite apart from anything else, all of those um, you know devastated Britain books, of which there were many. I think this really stands out in a lot of ways because it's got, there are two things that don't happen in this book that that often happen in some of those books, sometimes by even by reputable authors or reputable inverted common or inverted common authors, where there's no rampant racism and there's no sexual assault mm. in this book. I think you could probably expect that, maybe, with it being a, a New World's author or someone related to New World's, but it really does make it stand out amongst all of those books because even the book by, you know, Christopher Priest and people like that are there are some pretty rancid sections. In yeah, some yeah, of them, yeah. Even though you know, yeah, no, that, I don't enjoy them for for what they are anyway. That's true. And there's there's no uh, roving biker gangs either. Thinking no. of obviously no blade of blade of grass. Oh God, it's interesting. Have you seen the film? <laughs> yeah, <laughs> I need to see it again actually because I saw it at far too early an age, but it made a big impression on me. That film, it really did. Um, oh, holy shit! That that film really, in some ways, even though it's janky as hell. It does swing for the fences when it comes to being, you know what, we don't give a fuck. We're, we're just going to be as nasty as possible. It's a nasty film in many ways. Yeah. Very nasty. It really is. It's funny, actually, yeah. when you were just reading that bit about the fairground, it, it made me think it might be a coincidence. But, of course, this was around the same time that Moorcock had done the New World's Fair album, which is of obviously course. set in the, con- Dude. Uh, the yeah. contaminated fairground. So I don't know if that... Because I get the impression that Butterworth was literally pulling on anything he could, you know, yeah. at the time. So, maybe. Well, of course, he's, re- he's referenced the deep fix yeah. already, yeah, hasn't exactly. he? Exactly, so and maybe. For, you know, for people listening who might not realise, you know, realise that Moorcock had a connection with Harkwind and performed with them and, and wrote music for, for other bands like Blue Oyster Cult as well, actually had his own band who did, oh, did they do, they did, certainly did New World's Fair. New World's Fair was the only album was a, they did. They, they did a, there's a yeah, single... The, Dodgem dude, which which they recorded at the time, but UA refused to put out for some reason, and that only then came out. I think that came out in 1980 on Flick Knife, um, yeah. but which is and it's a fantastic song. I've got no idea why they didn't put it out at the time because I think it's a great song. Mm. Mm. So yeah, I mean, he's, he's certainly drawn on a lot of this stuff. But anyway, Hawkwind have a cozy overnighter in a surprisingly intact pub in a small <laughs> village where they consider their mooted transmutation into the legendary Hark Lords, as predicted by Moorlock's Sam of Doremi Faso Latido. And Moorlock reels off a load of entertaining guff about the the, the bowl of void, <laughs> the swords of life, mm. the will of heart air, which, yeah, when you say it, sounds ridiculous, and the third age of magic, and the first two Moorlock explains are symbols for universal energy. And the symbols for universal energy are not eating... <laughs> And immortality, which, which I, again I did laugh out loud at. It's like, right, yeah, don't eat. And 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 the gang, they all they buy it all, and they're like, holy shit, we are transmuted now into Hawk Lords on the back of all this. At this point, 
perhaps it's all a bit psychosomatic, but later on they do actually literally start to glow with they phosphorescence glow. Yeah. And, and gain certain powers to the point where one of them literally knocks a soldier's head off and leaves it dangling by a bit of sinew. So obviously they do have some kind of power. <laughs> and at this point, Higgy, bless him, is so affected by these revelations mm. that he guiltily takes out and surrenders a bottle of pills that he's been hoarding <laughs> and take it all to himself. So it's obviously had some kind of major effect on Higgy as well. And after some nightmares about death and burning that turn out to be quite prescient, the gang head back to Earth City, a.k.a. London, to find that a further disaster has befallen London. And we have to talk about this section because we get a depiction of murders and ruin inflicted by, as we soon find, the colonel and his men of the SOB. And once again, it is the match of any of the grim apocalyptic fiction of the time, but it's littered with stuff that made me laugh out loud. So you've got several pages of descriptions of, of bodies, people hanged, uh, terrible destruction, even on top of all the destruction that's taken place already at the hands of these soldiers. But the survivor of a butchered crew of one of the ruins of one of their broadcast towers, so the broadcast tower has been blown up, the crew, who seem to be in the midst of a shift change, have all been murdered, but they find someone. And he says, Hawkwind, thank God it's you. Again, just <laughs> laugh out loud funny. It's It's such a ridiculous line. And in the midst of all this grimness, it's wonderfully goofy. And then it's capped off because when confronted by a group of soldiers, they take them down with their music pistols, only for Lemmy to spring forward and say, let's kill these bastards, grab a submachine gun, and riddle them all with bullets. Yeah. <laughs> the lead on the ground. It's magnificent. Uh, this this crazy blend of Hawkwind as this sort of Scooby-Doo gang, and then the pessimistic violence. Mm. I just can't get enough of yeah. it. At this point, I'm realising this is the... I'm, well, I was going to say this is the best book I've read all year, but it's only the 7th of January. But it's the best book I've read, <laughs> or the most entertaining book. Maybe best isn't right, but it's the most entertaining book I've read in Yonks, this. I was I was enjoying the apocalyptic fiction side of it. I was enjoying the psychedelic stuff. And I was also laughing out loud of some of the just outright goofiness of it. It's incredible. And that bit actually put me in, in mind of a scrap of an interview that Simon Perrins of Can I Pod With Madness, listen to it on all good podcatchers, but he sent me a photograph of, I think it's from Kerrang. It's either going to be from Kerrang or Metal Hammer, knowing Simon, where Lemmy is asked what the worst book he's ever read is, and he says this. <laughs> he says, Time of the Hawk Lords, where I'm called Count Motorhead, it was written by some Butterworth bloke, is his response to the question. And I do wonder... Was that him just being deliberately obtuse and winding Butterworth up? Because they must have known each other. Because they must have to some degree moved in the same <laughs> mm. circles, perhaps. I don't know. It's, it's impossible to know now. Yeah, of course. yeah, no, exactly. But, I mean, I, yeah. I think in general, they, they, I think they felt a bit embarrassed by it. And it was just the, the yeah. embarrassment of it, I think, had stopped them from actually being able to appreciate whether it was actually an interesting or decently written book or not. Yeah, maybe so. Maybe so. But, it, yeah, it's it, it's just a shame that, c considering just how counterculture Hawkwind were, that they couldn't maybe just embrace the madness mm. of this mm. a little bit. Yeah. Uh, I don't know. I don't know. It only gets better, too, because after the bloody SOBs blow up the Hawkwind tour bus, the Hawk Lords, mm -hmm. who are now gl glowing phosphorescently, fiercely blast more soldiers with their sweet, sweet space rock, only to end up surrounded by more SOBs, who at this point are blasting out their own counter-tunes. And we've got a little list of what their counter-tunes are. Let's have a look. So, over the discordant melee produced by their own equipment came a rising tide of opposing sound. They listened appalled as fleeting snatches of the songs that were playing rose and died away. Sinatra's My Way. Ray Charles' I Can't Stop Loving You. Tony Blackburn's Chop Chop. Yeah. The Carpenters, yes, and 10cc. <laughs> yeah, I love the way the yes just creep in there. That's good. <laughs> yeah. yeah, it's fabulous. It's absolutely fabulous. Uh, there's more to come on that front as well. But fortunately, Hawkwind found that their, their music guns actually stop bullets. Colonel Mephis turns up in an armoured car, and he's glowing too, the bloody villain. So Mephis is taking on increased amounts of power fed by this death generator. So he's... And later on, he's actually effectively referred to as the Dark Lord. Mm. So he's he's become the full-on villain of all this. But fortunately, the music guns help them escape through ruined buildings where they head through Westbourne Park and meet up with Actonian, Doug and Co. 
but they hear that the situation is grim. All of the Delatron music towers and the crews have been destroyed and killed. Not only that, but when the cargo planes full of troops arrived, Mephis' men killed loads of the children. And worst of all, well, perhaps worse than killing. Is it worse? I don't know. But they destroyed all of the band's stage gear. So the situation is desperate. And at this point, I'm like, I love this book so much. <laughs> it's, <laughs> it's so, so ridiculous. It's fantastic. But they find that Morlock, bless him, still got all his deep fixed stage equipment back at his weird techno magiologically protected digs on Blenheim Crescent with his house computer called Victoria that he has a slightly odd relationship with and his own guitar called, well, what's his guitar going to be called? Stormbringer. Well, Stormbringer 2. Stormbringer 2, two actually, yeah. on this occasion. Why Stormbringer 2? Who knows? Hmm. And then we get possibly one of the best lines in the book. Astral Al and the Prince head to the palace to find Hot Plate, but the troops are playing a protective tune, and it says, From somewhere came a fearful, discordant noise which made them both feel sick. The Prince realised dimly that it was Bob Dylan's blowing in the wind. He shivered. <laughs> That's absolutely brilliant. I love it. Because, to be fair, Bob Dylan makes me shiver as well. I've never, ever, ever got... Bob Dylan. No, I agree. But I mean, it's interesting in a way that, that even Dylan is in there with the, the bad vibes music because, you know, now obviously, yeah. you know, ultimate countercultural hero. But, you know, things were seen differently yeah. in those days. And probably by 76, he was like this middle of the road character. Yeah. I, I do think that there must be a certain joy as an author to write in something like this and, you know, being like mildly tongue-in-cheek, able to <laughs> slag off lots of music that other people consider to be enormously progressive as the music of the straits, yeah. which just promotes bad vibes. <laughs> yeah, it's great. Oh, yeah, the rest of the gang take the deep fixes gear and set up a new base of ops on Parliament Hill and set up a new stage and start to play. It says they played for all they were worth, caught up in the need to win the Battle of Earth. The salving music doused the frustration of the agonising separation from their instruments. They played simply and powerfully, without their usual batteries of synths and mellotrons. Thunder Rider quivered with fulfilment. As the wave of deadly oppression lifted, they were reminded once again of their mission, to build a new world. Once more, they had been given the footing they needed. Now they were determined to start afresh. The claustrophobic cloud that had cast London into the impenetrable night for so long began to unfurl. Their music hammered at its sickly grey belly, battering it back. Gradually, the weak and watery daylight of a new dawn began to filter through. A large, pale sun emerged, riding high behind the vanishing, swirling clouds. A second, louder cheer rose from the stiff and starving assembly on the hilltop. The constant dark had done much to prevent them from recovering. They hugged and embraced one another in delight as the volume of sound increased, speeding unimpeded across the silent, newly emerged ruins. From the early days of being a small, rough-and-ready rock band able to jam anywhere at a moment's notice and bring impromptu gratification to the audience, Hawkwind had gone full circle. They had passed through the electronic, sophisticated phase and put on full-scale tours. Now they were a simple but vital group again. Now was the spacecraft's greatest moment, called from beyond the edges of time to free Earth from the dark web of evil. It remembered a hundred of the missions, all victories over the Straits, Isle of Wight in 1970, where the ship made its first real impact, outside the gate, playing for free. The charity concert at the Roundhouse for the Greasy Truckers in 1972. Liverpool Stadium, Chicago, Detroit, New York and Los Angeles. Called from the depths of space to fight for the new society of the Children of the Sun. Now its mighty engines thudded and strummed like they'd never done before. The complex of <coughs> writhing, stabbing sounds spun off the wooded, magical summit of Parliament Hill. The days of the black, mindless, visionless, selfish shape that for so long had dug its grey, parasitic roots into the minds of men, which had strangled their originality and freedom and sapped the strength of their youth in order to perpetuate its colossal satanic empires. The days of the blight on humanity were numbered. Mm, take that, straight. <laughs> yeah. One of the things, again, that, that appealed to me about this is that even at this point, they're talking about Hawkwood as having gone through multiple phases and having been everywhere and played everywhere. And this is 1976. And we're now in 2024. 
And actually, in 2023, they still released another album. Mm -hmm. So this is, they're babies. (laughs) (laughs) Despite all that, they're absolute babies in this. Yeah. The, the, so, the thing is, is that, know, I mean, we, we need our follow. Yeah, I mean, this is meant to be set some point in the future. You know, it's it's not meant mm. to be set in 1976. Though obviously, all of the songs that are referred course, to yeah. are obviously up, so. Like Butterworth doesn't invent a load of songs that they've written since. But it's never entirely yeah. sure at what point in the future this is this is happening. Yeah. Unfortunately, Hot Plate looks to have been taken by soldiers, but he left a clue as to where he may have been taken. Meanwhile, more sex ass action. <laughs> As if everything going on in this book going on isn't enough, the sex ass investigation gets expanded upon. So the press, we've already mentioned in inverted commas, are actually morality police that go into the virtual reality world that the middle class now exist in and have these gnarly powers to dole out punishment to anyone trying to regain their humanity by being perhaps a little bit saucy. So they're basically sex police who go into the simulation to keep people in line. There's a really cool bit where sex ass listens to his boss giving a talk to a load of trainees. So lots of straights are training to be press investigators. The sensational raw material of this nature, he said, referring to the picture of sexual acts on the screen, and these sexual acts have been recorded in the simulation, is carefully edited, and with other news items, continuous news bulletins broadcast to the occupants. When slanted right, local internal news serves to define the permissible boundaries of amoral behaviour, strengthening the social structure of the community, a necessity in our case where virtually the entire population of the planet is living inside a computer, and all individuals are part and parcel of the same basic mind of man. Only minor indulgences in idiosyncratic behaviour by the individual is permitted. The nostalgic attempt by John, for instance, to reinstate his lost bodily self through seemingly overt relationships with the deviant girl occupants is strictly dangerous magic. It could never come off, but can never be allowed. One of the functions of our agency is to make sure by the process of feedback already mentioned, a process, incidentally, very similar to the methods of control used by the old newspapers of the pre-dawn era, only a thousand times more effective, that this never happens. Absolutely fantastic. And with the exception of the reference to people living in the computer, so it's, it's predicting, essentially, rolling non-stop news that effectively polices mm-hmm. people's morals and ethics and what's normal and what's acceptable societally. It's it's brilliant. And again, it's throwaway. It's throwaway stuff that, that barely features in the book, really, other than, I mean, it is it is relevant to the plot, but it's such a, such a tiny element. And unfortunately for sex ass, because of course he's a press investigator of sex acts, he goes to the press club where they play John Denver on loudspeakers outside to hold back the tide of the Harkwood music. It gets caught by Stacia and the lads in a honey trap because they're convinced Stacia that they should uh, do a honey trap. She's not keen, but she, she agrees to do it. Because the Hawk Lords, once again, this book shifts, the Hawk Lords are going to run a heist on the control tower, Mission Impossible style, which they do, aided by an attack on the control tower by the reactionaries, which is described as the reactionaries <laughs> turn up and start attacking the tower. And the Baron and Thunder Rider get plugged into the computer matrix thing and have an adventure. And it's, this book just does not stand still. It's throwing it, 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 more and more fun little things. It really in. does clip along, actually. Yeah, that's true. Long story short, they do find Hot Plate inside the computer. They get out before the reactionaries blow up the tower. But now Hot Plate's consciousness has moved in with the Baron's. So you've got two minds sharing one body. Mm-hmm which is a little bit freaky for everybody. But once again, this book, never short on ideas. It's bonkers. It crams load in. I never expected it to be basically an end-of-the-world novel complete with desolate horror, war stories, Mission Impossible-style heists, virtual reality worlds, and there's still a third of it to go yet. It is just throwing everything in there. Book two rattles to a close with the Houndmaster having a massive trip (laughs) while he's driving the bus and having visions... Yeah, uh, having visions of the ancient history of Earth, where the Hawk God, as tends to happen, you know, all the time when you're tripping, the Hawk God tells him about the battle between the Throd Mike and their death generator, and th- the Bastar, the Bastar, the Bazark. Anyway, Bazark is it? Has he got a K? The in Bazark. It? The, I don't know. Yeah, I think it ends with a K. The, the Bazar. Yeah. So the Throd Mike are the baddies with their death generator. And the Bazark, the Bastark, whatever they are, um, they are who modern mankind essentially descended from. 
But the Hawk God also tells him that the Hawkwind gang are advanced human beings whose ascension has been accelerated by the Delatron. You know what? If some Hawk God told him it while he was tripping, it must be true. <laughs> and frankly, everybody takes that on board and they're quite happy to go with it. Which is reasonable. We now get introduced to some mysterious dude having dreams of Odin in Asgard House. I think there's two references to him. Some guy dressed in white, we don't really know who he is at this point, but he decides he must return to Earth. At this stage, loads of folk from around the world have arrived in the Earth City and have joined the children around the stage. But as book two comes to a close, Mephis is preparing to strike via surreptitious means. Mm. Mm. He's got spies in the camp. Mm. Book three, we're gonna we're probably going to rattle to a close here. But book three, the battle for the Earth, the death generator's increasing in power, even Heartwind and the Delatron can't hold back the tide. But lo, a ship in the sky. Who could it be? Well, it's just Captain Robert Calvert returning from space in a silver machine. Yeah. Huzzah! <laughs> Amazing. I, I, I was wondering if Del Detmar would come back and help him, but he doesn't. It's Calvert. Yeah. Nevertheless, things take a turn for the worse when Astral Isle's mind gets invaded by one of Mephi's mutated ghouls. Mephi, the soldiers who work for Mephi are all getting mutated and weird and turned into almost like, you know, pustule-covered chaos creatures. Mm -hmm. And they also appear to have uh, the ability to infiltrate the mind of people. And poor Astral Al gets his mind infiltrated by this ghoul, and he messes things up by hogging the mic and singing shit songs. Which is... <laughs> <laughs> Which is absolutely incredible. They do something else with another infiltrated person a little bit further on. But I did love the idea of like, yes, we've infiltrated one of Hawkwind and his way of messing things up is to grab the mic and sing shit songs. It's incredible. To make matters worse, more mutated ghouls are infiltrating the city and attacking. So what's to do? Well, Robert Calvert's got the answer. Build more silver machines because the earth is close to disintegration or something. I started to lose track yeah, yeah. of exactly what the what, threat what was, was at this point. Yeah. Anyway, it's all ramping yeah. up. <laughs> it's, all getting, it's all getting more and more serious. But it's all going wrong. Poor Stacia has her own mini-adventure that turns into a bit of a nightmare when the ghoul that took control over Astral Al hits her with a music gun playing Dean Martin's That's Amore, and she can't deal with it. So she falls prisoner to Mephis, and her mind is also overwhelmed by another ghoul. Again, formerly an army dude. I think one of them's a major and one of them's a captain mm -hmm. or something, and you get like a little insight into into their straight minds. And to cut a long story short, they sabotage the silver machines, and that is summarising things pretty substantially. But they do get rumbled. Um, I am I'm a, I am probably skipping over quite a lot, but it's it does get quite psychedelic. A blinding flash of light exploded in front of them, forcing them to a sudden halt. Momentarily, they blacked out from the effects and reeled backwards. When they came around, they saw the gaunt figures and drained faces of Astral Al and Stacia. They were standing together in front of them. Astral Al held a Delatron in his hand. Stacia still had the menacing object that had arrested them with such force. Through their narrowed vision, the Hawklods could see that it was a pocket tape recorder, its spools revolving and emitting small bursts of jagged light. Faintly, above the sound of their own band still playing behind them, they could hear the cataleptic strains of Elton John's Daniel, a most nauseating and stultifying sound. Well, you lousy motherfuckers, the Baron shouted out in disgust. You double-dealing pair of shits. <laughs> you were right, Doug, he said, with loathing in his voice to the Hawk Lord at his side. There is someone from our own kind trying to kill us off. There they are. Their true colours start to show when the going gets tough. But it's all right, because Morlock turns up with a magnum and shoots the cassette recorder. <laughs> It's just such a brilliant visual. Elton John's Daniel playing and them all, like, you know, losing it and Brock shouting, <laughs> you motherfuckers. You, motherfuckers. <laughs> <laughs> you, you double dealing pair of shits. Yeah. And then Mocock just turns up and shoots the tape recorder with a magnum. <laughs> uh, it's wonderful. But now, finally, the silver machines can at least go to their task, which is to surround the death generator and blast it at close range with Hawkwind. By flying up the M6 and finding the tower it's in, just past Stoke on Trent. Yes. yes. <laughs> uh, there is a little bit more to it than that. Well, but, well this uh, is because obviously, you know, because Butterworth was from Manchester, that's why the actual action at the end of the book happens in Manchester. Yeah. Huh. And 
funnily enough, there, there is a little bit of Deus Ex Machina at the end because as it happens, Mephig makes it slightly easier for them by blowing his own brains yeah. out. Yeah, and the Earth is safe. So and it, it ends. Why it ends pretty quickly, doesn't it? Yeah, <laughs> at that point. It does. Yeah, it it, it rattles to a close extraordinarily quickly. Yeah. And I think it is suggested that Mephig at one point is thinking that this is ultimate power for him, but it starts to dawn on him that actually the final result of all this is that the Earth will disintegrate. Mm. And maybe that's when he suddenly realises that his gambit for ultimate power as a Dark Lord mm. was actually doomed to failure either way. Yeah. So he just tops himself. Yeah. So <laughs> the Earth is so, saved, yeah. as well as probably maybe 300 people left alive. Well, on it. Is it, at one point it because... says there's only 12 children of are left. It's like very precise. That's right. 12. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. The Hawk Lords muse on how they, were, how they were actually successful, because I think they're a bit baffled as to how easy it was as well when they finally got mm. there. And it says, uh, the death generator, it's stopping, Actonium Doug was the first to want to realise what had happened. He gasped. But that's impossible. We didn't... Thunder Rider began. A smile of sheer joy was appearing on his lips. Whatever made it stop, it wasn't us, the captain remarked happily. It must have stopped on its yeah. own. That's bloody incredible, the Baron muttered, staring disbelievingly around him. There's not a stick left. The earth lay perfectly flat and still and featureless in the strong light. There were no buildings of any sort. Its surface was strewn with debris. Here and there, the runner of a large crack appeared. It was impossible to tell whether city, farmland or open country had once laid beneath them. We've achieved what we were ordained to do, the Baron proclaimed in a a reverent voice. Eh? Thunder Rider looked at him puzzled. What do you mean? The Hawkwind legend, the Baron said. Don't you remember? It said, and in the future of time, blah, 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 the Hawkwinds will return to smite the land, blah, blah, blah. (laughs) The dark forces will be scourged and the cities and towns raised. A strange feeling crept over them as they listened. It shook the body. They felt fulfilment, yet something was missing. That's right, Thunder Rider exclaimed. And it went on to say the race cities shall be made into parks. Peace shall come to everyone. He looked at them optimistically. Inspired dreams blazed in his eyes. As soon as we return, he jumped in the air and then ran up and down the deck of his silver machine, whooping in ecstasy. And yeah, the right, you, you, you're absolutely right. There's By the end, Stacey and Astral are restored. The entire surviving population of Earth can fit around the Hawkwind stage and the consciousness of Hot Plate, saviour of the planet, has left the Baron's noggin. And yes, it does point out that 12 children <laughs> remain. It's not a great result, is so, it? <laughs> the Earth is it's saved. Hooray for Hawkwind, basically. Yeah. Yeah. Everybody else yeah. is dead. Yeah, absolutely incredible. Oh, it's so funny. And it, The final line is, they fell silent as each paid a tribute to the brave scientist. A true Hawk mm. The end. The end. <laughs> or is it? Of the time of the Hawk Lords. Yeah. Well... Yeah. Considering there's only about 30 people left alive, there's a second mm. novel, and I've got it on a shelf, so I might have to go and check it out at some point. But thoughts, thoughts, <laughs> Joe, on the time of the Hawk Lords? Um, well, that second novel is, is if you thought this one was nuts, the second one is completely nuts, <laughs> really nuts. And, <sighs> yeah, that, that, that's def- very much worth reading, uh, but it is, it's, it's completely nuts. Um, I mean thoughts i mean what can you say i mean that was a very good synopsis actually um, and and i mean it, it's it is actually you know and you pointed out as we went along a lot of it is actually quite well written to say that is so ridiculous mm. i mean butterworth basically as i said was just pulling bits and pieces in wherever he could and there's quite a few bits and pieces in here supposedly from a um a, 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 a post-apocalyptic novel uh, well, post-apocalyptic novel that he was writing which he didn't complete, hmm. maybe because he kind of stuck it all in here instead. So that's why kind of you get a lot of those passages and they're quite long um, because I think they were pre-existing. Hmm. And so he kind of wrote around hmm. it, uh, you know, which, which, which is great. I think it's when, when I spoke to him, one of the things that was, was interesting was this whole divide between the kind of good vibes music and, and the bad vibes music and saying that, I mean, you know, in 1976, you know, hippies versus straights kind of on the one hand seems, you know, completely outmoded. But actually, you know, the, mm. the, uh, the same battle was about to be reenacted again between the punks and the, and the straight world. So, mm. you know, that 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 in itself was kind of, you know, w- was was still a thing. And the, the, this divide between good, you know, kind of the countercultural society or 
you know, kind of alternate culture society versus straight society. He was kind of saying how much stronger it was felt. I mean, these days, particularly where everything is just it's all kind of mushed together, it's all part of a continuum. I mean, mm. it, obviously, in many mm. ways, it's a much more polarized society, but culturally, so much has got mushed together, whereas people really were offended by straight music in those days the i you know the idea of this stuff yeah. it really was felt to be you know kind of quite quite evil i mean it was a serious thing in your life to vow you know not to listen to this music and to have your own kind of music that you listen to whether that be hawkwind or whether it be then you know the coming punk bands so that that was something mm. that he was he, he he was kind of quite um uh, you know kind of um it was a very important for him that 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 came through, and that was mm. one of the driving forces behind mm. the behind the whole thing. Is there even a modern equivalent of those countercultures? Everything is so. I don't think things are so com- compartmentalized as they used to be. Everything, you know, with with uh, the internet and the virtual world. I mean, you know, essentially the millions of middle class people who were living in a computer in time <laughs> of the Harklods were all. We've all got one foot in the computer mm-hmm. now. Anyway, mm-hmm. it's just that it's 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 a little bit more wild west, you know. Where where there were morality police trying to police what we were up to, you know, that seems to be slipping away, and it's becoming a little bit more of a free for all. It's it's really incredible reading these books, and and it's it's lovely to read these books and reflect back on what society was like and how you know even with stuff like Mocock's The Black mm-hmm. Corridor and other books, how you know, certain things were predicted intentionally or unintentionally about how things might look about 24 hour news and everything else. There's lots of stuff in the black corridor that's really prescient. The problem with all that prescience is it fails to predict the basic underpinning of how society operates now and just how the entire world is essentially online. And even things like Neuromancer never got anywhere near how wild things are now you know we're in this weird situation now where transhumanism is Mm. a thing but the transhumanism that we all thought about when we were reading these books was like yeah putting a hundred megabytes in your head drive in your brain or yeah why is in your head or whereas now it's going to turkey to alter your body cosmetically Mm -hmm. to have ginormous lips or insane teeth or anything else so it's like transhumanism is here but it's so banal and disappointingly wank <laughs> in a way that nobody could have ever possibly predicted. Well, I mean, that, it's exactly. Incredible. It's the way things quickly become, you know, they appear, they're amazing. And then they very quickly become banal, you know, like the internet's amazing. Yeah. My, you know, mobile phones are amazing, but then quickly they become this banal and quite insidious part of society. And of course, kind of what's happened with, with the internet and social media is that it's you know, this idea of, you know, that you would, if you could only bring everybody together, there would be some kind of beautiful singularity and everybody would realize that they were part of the same wonderful mm. mind. It hasn't at all. It just means that kind of all of the poisons and diseases and bad ideas just spread more quickly. And that's, that's the real mm. problem we have. And, you know, so everything is, is much more in the seventies and these post-apocalyptic books, you know, there was very obvious and real threats there you know it's kind of nuclear war and there's the kind of ecological breakdown was being talked about and even things like overpopulation was like a major theme in the early 70s and there were these external kind of threats this this thing that was gonna you know ruin the world and ruin the landscape and and turn everybody against each other but actually you didn't you didn't need that at all all you needed to do was effectively put the whole world in one room and let them get on with it mm. and uh, you know and and, mm. and you know kind of it's it's a bit like you don't need anything else, you know. It's it, whatever kind of comes out of people's heads these days. You know, that's that's the real enemy. Gosh, that sounds pessimistic, doesn't mm. it? <laughs> yeah, but I, I, you know, I for one, I'm particularly pessimistic about things because I am really upset that I can't. Instead of going to Japan to spend five thousand pounds or five hundred thousand yen on getting um, tranquilizer darts that I can shoot out of my yeah. fingers. No, I can't do that. But I can go to Turkey and spend five thousand pounds on a permatan. <laughs> And a set of white teeth that will make me look like a bulldog wearing false teeth. <laughs> you know, it's it's just not how I imagined it, and it's it's bitterly disappointing. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. absolutely. Thanks for coming on to talk about uh, time of the Harklords and sitting there quite patiently while I spoiled the entire book. <laughs> but 
This is essentially what we do on Breakfast of the Ruins. We That's spoil right. every book that we talk about. <laughs> I mean, I'm just looking at what I, I had in the, in the book, and one of the things that, that Michael had, he, Michael Butterworth, he had, he had all of the kind of old reviews for it, and um, it didn't get ah. it didn't get brilliant reviews, it's fair to say. But the uh, the one from Charles Sean Murray in the NME is uh, is particularly amusing, where he describes it as an almost terrifyingly bad novel, adding if. <laughs> if I was any of the past or present members of Hawkwind caricatured in this book, I wouldn't leave the house for six months. You know? <laughs> but you know, well, I don't think they necessarily would have had that problem because did it even well, sell this is, well? So this is the know. thing that's interesting. So I mean, in a way, kind of what we haven't talked about is the whole context around it with as 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 the Hawkwind, if you like. I mean, this according to Butterworth, Time the Hawk Lord sold fifty thousand copies around the world, which is not ah. like a bestseller, but that's. 50,000 copies, 50,000 people bought this book. And that's why yeah. kind of, you know, then Star said, right, okay, let's do a sequel. And Queens of Deliria kind of then was rushed out. I mean, he wrote, only wrote that in a few months, apparently. Uh, and that, that didn't, that didn't yeah. read, uh, sorry, didn't sell uh, as much. That only sold 15,000 copies. But, um, mm. but the idea that kind of you would, somebody said, okay, this band, I mean, because, you know, they, they weren't kind of number one, stars but they were they were big enough for them to say okay yeah go ahead and kind of write this book i mean you know because 1975 mm. i suppose when it was starting to be written would have been about the peak of their popularity in britain so it kind of makes sense in a way yeah but then of course you also get this other stuff i mean when you're going through the the list of characters there at the start you've got lemmy and paul rudolph in the band at the same time which obviously never happened. You know, mm. Lemmy was replaced by Paul Rudolph, mm. but it was a bit like, well, we've got to keep Lemmy in because he's such a popular character, you know, for kind of, you know, all the fans. Yeah. So that's why you've got a weird stuff like that happening as well. I, I just find it incredible that these books were written in the first place and somebody thought that this is a good idea, you know. The, yeah. the one other yeah. thing I just want to mention, if, if you don't know Queens of Deliria, is that it's actually for um, Elric completists is a must-read novel because ah. Elric makes a cameo in Queens of Deliria. So, yeah, right. so, so yeah, he's he's in there. Uh, he, he doesn't do very much, to be honest. He's, he's I don't think he's with Moonglom, but he's with some companion. Um, but he turns up and doesn't really do very much, but he is in there. So, you know, kind of obviously Moorcock, Moorcock, whose name is kind of prominently featured on the front of Queens of Deliria, who had absolutely nothing to do with Queens of Deliria whatsoever, except for presumably said yeah. to Butterworth, yeah, you can use Elric if you want to. So there is that. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, having his name on the cover, I'm surprised it never sold more than 15,000 copies. But even Time of the Hawklaws at 50,000 copies, I mean, by today's standards, that's a fuck ton mm. of books. But I suppose by the 1970s standards, yeah. where, you know, a, a, an NEL book, a, a, a Crabs book by Guy and Smith would sell 500,000. Yeah. Yeah or something i suppose i suppose it's well exactly modest. i mean i don't know how yeah. many i mean like more cock paperbacks i mean how many were they selling when they came out have you any idea i mean you know do you something have like idea? i mean so no 74 idea. 75 would that be a was it the second current books around then yeah the second car and books were around about then i think he'd done elric of mel nibbana in 73 mm. so after that point he was moving on to things like um the second three heart moon books right, so okay. count brass okay. champion yeah, of yeah. garathon were probably around yeah. about that time quest for tanalon can't remember the exact dates but yeah he's, he's in that probably third yeah. stage of his career if, if, if his first stage is the early 60s yeah. with the fix of mm. novels like the original issues of stormbringer with um a lot of his sci-fi and then the second stage is his write a book in three days splurge of writing the heart moon novel, novels the yeah, moon yeah. novel sorry more elric stuff and then yeah, the early seventies is when he's he's not quite set off on his trek to become more literate, but he's definitely reapplying himself to some of his old yeah. characters. And but he, he, even then, I mean, he's um, you know the the second Karam sequence is I think he's it's probably fair to say is still whilst there you could argue that in some ways his writing in the early seventies I think some people would argue is in inverted commas better. I think it lacks some of the vitality of the stuff that he wrote mm. in the 60s. But it's definitely in that stage where he's trying to come up with an overall 
wraparound theme for his Eternal mm. Champion stuff, certainly with things like the quest mm-hmm. for Tanalon, before he really goes off on his track of trying to be literary. literary by the time he's doing things like Condition yeah, yeah, of exactly, Music. Yeah, yeah. You know, and uh, and getting into his uh, Mother London yeah, yeah. and Yeah, I mean, like so that, I get yeah. the impression that, yeah. I mean, he, as I said, I mean, Hawkwind at the time, were they were kind of slightly distancing themselves from it because, you know, they had stopped being... Um, well, I mean, there was still obviously a science fiction band, but by this point, you know, Calvert had joined the band. And, you know, in 77, when Queens of Delirium comes out, you know, they're doing Quark, Strangeness and Charm, which is this kind of, you know, quite arch modernist mm. kind of, um, you know, satirical SF. And, and completely at odds with something like Queens yeah. of Delirium, which, as I said, is, is basically like Biggles on acid. I mean, it's it's completely nuts. Um, you know, so, yeah. so they, they kind of distance <laughs> themselves. And Moorcock was also, you know, quite happy for them just to kind of fade away because by that point he was wanting to be a seen as a slightly more literary writer if you like um so yeah Mm -hmm. so they're they're kind of oddities and obviously there's a there's a third part of the trilogy as well um which at the time doesn't get written um but then appears um as a uh comic uh or a graphic novel by a guy called bob walker uh and it's bizarrely it's only included in a us box set um and it's called ledge of darkness and uh and i've, I've got a pdf of it somewhere and i <laughs> confess i haven't kind of read it properly but but that's kind of quite interesting that that eventually did did come out but i think that was 92 was it maybe when that came out so you know yeah i think it was like a far, far lp it, it was, it was exactly it was Griffin set, music so kind of uh mm. you know these the uh you know they started kind of putting stuff out and uh they did that. But on saying that, then kind of, you know, there are little references to Time of the Hawk Lords and the Jeff Death Generator start appearing in Hawkwind lyrics, particularly during the 90s. I mean, you know, kind of anything, you know, so, the, so mm. they do kind of reference it again. So it becomes part of the mythology, if you like. Um, but uh, yeah, I mean, it, it's still to me uh, like the main takeaway is just what an extraordinary thing to, to do, to have like a series of books written about you. I mean, even... I don't know. I mean, did did Kiss? I mean, Kiss. There were comics written about Kiss. But I don't think they had books yeah. written about them. I can't think of any other bands where this happened. No, but they did have Kiss Meet the well, Phantom of the okay. Park, which escalates them above everything else. <laughs> yeah, I, I don't know if you've ever seen Kiss no. Meet the Phantom of the Park. Oh <laughs> my word! It is. It, it 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 sits in the realm of so unbelievably shoddy and incompetent and bad that it is pure genius. Yeah, it's incredible, and it's set at it's set at a oh, fun fair. Okay, yeah. um, but weirdly you, enough, but you're right. I mean, it's yeah. interesting actually mm. to look at the graphic novel of Ledge of Darkness, and like you said, why hadn't you know? It kind of lends itself to some bizarre kind of cartoon or something that you know that I, I love the idea actually of Hawkwinders like. You know, in the mystery machine or the yellow van of they've got there. Yeah. Um, you know, yeah, yeah. and that's that's totally yeah, yeah. the image I got but when they go to Brighton. Have, you know, juxtaposed with like some quite violent scenes, like I say, the bit where Lemmy's gonna say, "Right, kill the bastards," yeah. and you know, kind of shoots every. You know, yeah. and it's it's like, gosh, okay. <laughs> yeah, I think I think it's the Baron who who, who cl- sweetly knocks a soldier's head off and leaves it dangling. I mean, Dave Brock. Dave Brock well, looks like he's the kind of man who can very... do that. You know, he's 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 a well muscled <laughs> Devon lad, I think, at at one point. So it might not be that description. That's another piece of uh Portwin mythos where he's described as that. But uh but yeah. <laughs> yeah. Funny enough, you know, as as you were talking about um mm. bad reviews of Time of the Hawk Lords, for our birthday episode in December, we had a, a very lazily assembled quiz where I found one-star reviews of Mocock books and did a quiz with Phil and Laws, and they had to guess what book these one-star reviews were about. It was extraordinarily lazy, but we got drunk and had good fun with it. So I thought I'd just see if I could find a one-star review of Time of the Hawk Lords yeah. on Goodreads. And there's only one, and it just says, I couldn't even finish this. To, uh, not a great review, not a particularly no. useful review, but that's the only yeah. one-star review. The rest of oh, them right, are actually quite in- good. That's there's interesting, a couple of two actually, stars. yeah. Um, I I, did, I would have loved to. Mm. I mean, I didn't. You know, when I was writing the book, I I did kind of you know ask you know, or, or or kind of poll various kind of fans for their opinions about you know what they thought about you know Hawkman when they'd seen them live in the seventies, et cetera, et cetera. 
but I didn't actually think to ask anybody, what did you think about, you know, what was your opinion when you read Time of the Hawk was? Because clearly, you know, 50,000 people bought it. Mm. Somebody read it at the time. Mm. And there must be a lot of copies out there if 50,000 copies mm. were sold. Yeah, he got me my copy, and I found another one in better condition from a second-hand mm. shop in Markham for yeah. a reasonable price. So my uh, my other one, I think I will send out to a lucky patron Ooh. who I'll select probably in the outro of this so someone will get a copy. But I've got a copy of Queen's of Delirium, and people say that that's actually really hard yeah, to get hold um, of I, I think it's because, yeah, because um, yeah, I was talking on Twitter about this earlier, that I as, as it only sold 15,000, I assumed that, you know, I mean, there's obviously less out there in the wild, but maybe they just kind of pulped kind of the rest of them. And, and you know, so there's just there's just less mm. out there. Um, as you said, I mean, it is it's been re-released oh. um, recently on that that weird. It's like a German publisher. I thought it was like print on demand or something. But you, you think they're actually physical copies that are coming over from Germany? Yeah, I mean, they may be print on demand. Uh, I don't know, but I ordered them right. through Amazon Germany, which was the only okay. place I could order them from, which I found through yeah. Michael Butterworth's website. So they are an order, and hopefully they'll, hopefully they'll arrive before I edit this so I can actually refer to the uh, the form yeah, yeah. of the introduction I think when, um, when, I, when I put the podcast together. But yeah, okay, they're on the, the way. Fore- and also the text is revised yeah. the text as I well. I think the foreword is, um, I think it's online somewhere. I think it's like, you know, Google Books give you a preview. Right. I'm sure I've read that foreword, actually, now that you mention it. Ah. I've seen it online, I'm sure. Um, yeah. I don't know how much he's revised it. He actually sent through um, a few pages to me of, of stuff that never got put into the book, which hopefully yeah. uh, I, I, I might be coming out at some point in in, in another thing I'm going to do, so, which is kind mm. of interesting. So, But, I mean, he, he always kind of maintained that the books were first draft. They were never really edited. It was kind of like, got to hit the deadline. Mm. Uh, and that was it, basically. But I think he was kind of secretly quite proud of them or, you know, kind of it was an achievement. You know, you, you got a book out there with your name on it. Yeah. And and a, a, as you know, I mean, he then, you know, goes and performs Savoy books with David Britton. And that in itself is a, is a fairly incredible story, mm. you know, becomes, you know, kind of friends mm. with Joy Division and New Order and all the rest of it. So. Mm. You know, he had an interesting look. Well, he has an interesting yeah, life. Yeah, fascinating bloke. Yeah, on, on the um, advice of um, Chris Hart, aka Dirt the Dice, who was on our Letters from Hollywood mm-hmm. episode, he um, actually pointed me to uh, a book which I picked up, which I think is most right. comprised of essays. Um, in fact, I can actually see it from where I'm sat. Right. So just give me a second. Yeah, Savoy oh, Dreams. Okay, the Secret Life Savoy book. Yeah. Let's look. Uh, William Burroughs, Michael Moore, Carl Ellis, and Alan. Uh, Mike Harding. Mike Harding. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> Gerald Scarf, Jack Trevor Story, Adam and the Ants, Barrington Bailey, Samuel Delaney. But yeah, I've, oh, I've, okay. I've not got around to reading it. Oh, interesting. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, but uh, let's have a look at that. So yeah, but yeah, all all absolutely fascinating stuff, and it just, again, it just kind of blows open yeah. all of that wider stuff that was going on around the time, yeah. around all the new worlds. Oh, I really, I really like that. I, 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 I like the fact that you liked it so much because you know I think the standard, there's a standard kind of, you know, what people kind of think of of it as a, a bit of a, a bit of a joke and a bit of a novelty. And um, you know, as I said, even kind of probably hmm. most Hawkwind fans haven't bothered reading it. But I think if you're a if you're an Hawkwind nut, you should read this because it's 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 really yeah, entertaining. Absolutely. It's an entertaining book, you know, and it's not. Not badly. Yeah. It really, as I said, it, it you know it, it it really moves along. I mean, it, it doesn't get bogged down at all. There's plenty happening in it, and as you say, it's full of hmm. full of interesting ideas. Actually, it really is. Well, f- I mean, I'm not a Harkwind nut. I like me some Harkwind, but I'm not a hardcore not Harkwind nut. I don't know the far end of a fart about them or anything else. But I am a Britain is fucked <laughs> apocalyptic weirdness nut. Yeah, and I love I love all those yeah. NEL novels and ev- anything to do with Britain in a state yeah. of decay and weird shit going on. I can't get enough of it, and so, so for that reason, it it's, ticks lots of boxes. Yeah. The fact that you've got Harkwind running around in a van going on a holiday to Brighton <laughs> with Sonic guns shooting their music is just icing on the cake, you know. Yeah, it's great stuff. that bit, I that it. bit where Can't I was going to ask you, I, I couldn't, I couldn't think. There's the bit where they go into the inn, and as you say, it's all kind of suddenly, it's it's all great, and they have this free course meal. I don't know where on earth they're getting the food from, and it's all, oh, we turn into the Hawk Lords, 
and then they wake up in the morning and then they find out that it's all been a terrible nightmare and that the inn is kind of falling apart kind of around them and it really reminded me yeah. of some there's some classic story where that happens where you know somebody goes into this perfect house and then kind of they kind of realize something and then the house starts falling apart i couldn't think what it was i mean it's it's probably it's it's a, probably a recurrent kind of motif in a lot of stories but it really reminded me of something but i couldn't put my finger on it it was like you know kind of almost like an old fairy tale or something where this had happened yeah when they go to brighton it's it's the entire theme of it is is like mm. sort of haunted britain and because you've got the weird ghostly, the dark ghostly figure that they dispel and, and also sort of disperse with the weapons. And then they go to this G-D. village, Rottingdean, yeah. I think it's called, isn't it? They go to the visit, village of Rottingdean, which to them looks pristine and untouched. And it is like they're in ghost country and, they're, and they've been pulled into this place where in actual fact they're probably eating yeah. moldy, rotten food, yeah. but they're not realising it. While they're sitting in Moloch, the Moloch, the, the Moloch yeah. is, is regaling them with with all of the lore and the background and everything. And the when and when they wake up the next morning, they realise that they're in a rotting shit hole, you know. And and it just sort of adds, it piles on that wonderful, ghost ridden, haunted seaside mm. town atmosphere. Yeah. It's fantastic. I love it. It's throwaway. There's never any, you know, obvious explanation for it. Yeah. It just comes and goes. It is great, but it's wonderful. So much stuff in this novel just comes and goes, but it's delicious <laughs> and flavorful. Brilliant. And, uh, yeah, I love it. Brilliant. Absolutely love it. So, on well, that you know, point, yeah. on that positive note, thanks, Joe, for coming and talking about Time of the Hawk Lords. Um, of course, I've not asked you, what are you up to at the moment? Um, what are you I working think, on? I can't remember. The last time I spoke to you, I kind of said, so um, uh, maybe I didn't. Um, I'm, I'm writing a book on Peter Hamill and Van de Graaff Generator. I did, yeah. So I, that is literally yeah. all last year. That's that's pretty much what I've been doing. Um, I've kind of cut down on all my other hmm. writing. So, and that's going to be another monster tome. And I'm about two thirds of the way through, and I hope to have finished the first draft. Well, my, I'm, I'm meant to finish the first draft by June, and I think I should just about do that. But it's hmm. uh, it's a, it's another big one. It's a similar kind of structure to Days of the Underground. So there's a lot of talking about the music as much as there is biographical kind of narrative stuff and there's going to be a couple of couple mm. two or three essays in there not as many as kind of stays the underground but looking at the kind of themes in in kind of hamill's songs and, and what he's interested in um so yeah so that's that's the main thing mm. but there is this other thing that i kind of alluded to a bit ago that hopefully is going to happen quite soon which is when um days of the underground came out when the special edition came out it came with a separate book called Sideways Through Time, which was uh, mm. basically a, a collection of all the interviews that I did for the book. And it was originally just available with a special edition. Uh, and a, a lot of people since have said, oh, I would have loved to have got a copy of that. So that's going to come out as a standalone yeah. second printing. Um, and it's got a load more stuff in it, about another eight extra interviews in there. So I'm hoping that's going to come out in the next few months, fingers crossed. And, uh, and as I said, that I think is going to, contain like a couple of pages of uh from time of the hawk lords that, that never made it into the original novel oh superb yeah. that sounds fantastic right Thank well you. again thanks joe i will let you know what i make of these mm, hardbacks when they arrive but in the meantime thanks again for dropping by darian tom thank you and we'll catch you All next right. time Massive thanks to Joe for returning to Derry and Tom's once more. You can check out details about his book on Hawkwind at daysoftheunderground.com, which I strongly recommend as it has loads of additional info, appendices, links to audio and visual goodies, including rare interviews and lots of other ephemera like press, cuttings, articles, album artwork and other amazing stuff. It's a real treasure trove. And we will, of course, keep you posted on his latest project on Peter Hamill and Van de Graaff Generator as we get more details. As it happens, I realised when I was editing this podcast that there was a Hawkwind spin-off band called Hawk Lords in the late 70s, and more recently. So I bemoaned the fact to Joe that I ne- neglected to ask him about that, and he kindly sent me this short version, which I'll have to read to you in my whole tones. But imagine if you can, that they're coming from Joe himself. OK, the short version. Hawkwind split up in March 78 after an American tour. 
Dave Brock then decided to put a new band together that he wanted to call the Sonic Assassins, so see that Mocock and Cawthorn comic strip of the same name. But manager Doug Smith said, why not call yourself the Hawk Lords instead, as it suggests some kind of continuity with the old band. Hawkwind had often been referred to informally as the Hawk Lords by fans and press for a long time anyway, even before the books. See, the prophecy on the inner sleeve of 1972's Doremi Facel Letido, for example, which was obviously a big inspiration for the time of the Hawk Lords. So Brock's new band, new in inverted commas, even though it was fronted by Bob Calvert, Hawkwind's creative wellspring, went out as the Hawk Lords and made an album under that name in 1978, which is variously referred to as self-titled or 25 years on. Nothing's ever straightforward with Hawkwind. This one, with the oiled bloke and the fluorescent tube on the front, but even during the following tour, both promoters and Brock were referring to it as a Hawk Lord stroke Hawkwind presentation, with the Hawk Lords just being an alter ego of Hawkwind. And sure enough, by the following year, they'd gone back to being Hawkwind. The Hawk Lords band that currently exists came about when a group of ex-Hawkwind members got together to play at a Barney Bubbles memorial concert and called themselves that, and then decided to continue as a band. The original lineup featured Harvey Bainbridge and Steve Swindles, who had played on the original Hawk Lords album. But these days, there isn't any connection to the original Hawk Lords. Thanks for following up with that, Joe. Much appreciated. The Apex editions of Time of the Hawk Lords and Queens of Deliria are available now. I had to source my copies from Amazon Germany, but I'd love to think that at some point they'd be available from other stockists too. And perhaps they are, and I just didn't look hard enough. Finally, thanks as always to our patrons for keeping this show on the road. First, those without tear. Anthony Picanti, Tim Cardos, Dave Dempster and Sebastian Weetabix. And our chaos engineers, Andrew C. Cluna, Andrew Spong, Andrew Van Ness, Anthony Porter, Benjamin Fletcher, Bill O'Cat, Brandon Mays, Dave Griffiths, Dave Voxman, Gabriel Laycock, Harvey Faulkner Aston, Jim Kirkland, Jim Knight, John W. Lays, Jules Lawrence, Mal Pertwee, Mary Catherine, Matt Saltz, Nelbert, Ofer Ziv, Paul McRandall, PJ Cooper, Scott Butler, Simon Perrins, and new to the Don Blass, Jim Jupp. If you haven't heard of Jim or his record label, Ghost Box Records, get on it right now. Ghostbox is partly responsible for one of my most recent vinyl splurges, with terrific releases from Large Plants, The Advisory Circle, and Chiron landing on my shelf, along with a couple of platters by Jim's own project, Belberry Polly, including their last album, The Path, which I can only describe as exquisite, narrated, prog-folk electronica with just the funkiest grooves. I'll link to Ghostbox Records in the show notes. And if you have heard of Jim and Ghostbox Records, well, if you know, you know. And of course, thanks to our crafty Jugaderos, Alexander Harris, Christian Hundal, Elian Weston Ra, Loz, Taylor, Matthew Broom, Graham Holden, and Toby White. And eternal thanks to our patron demons, Alistair Davison, Andy Clark, Andy Darby, and some Andy Darby news to report as it happens. You'll remember Andy from our episode discussing his Me and the Monkey books, and of course, he joined me to talk about The Winds of Limbo in 2023 when he mentioned his next novel. Well, good news on that score. The novel has a name, The Blade in the Angel's Shadow, and a publication date of March 31st, 2024. So more news to come on that, and congratulations, Andy. And thanks to David Lee, Fred Keish, Gareth Wilson, Glenn Sawyer, Greg Faulkner, Gwen Barlow, Ian Stead, Imria, Janie Stim, Jason Vogel, Jay Reeser, Joe Monty, Lee Gary, Mark Hebden, Marius Latowskis, Miles Reed Labato, Neil Burton, Paul Hillary, Randall Gatlin, Steve Round, Tom Murphy, Tony Malazzo, the OG patron, Norman Beresford, and last, but of course, never least, Robert McMillan. So enough from me. Don't forget you can follow us on Twitter and Instagram with the handle at Breakfast Ruins. You can email us at breakfastruins at outlook.com. The webpage is breakfastintheruins.com. BITR Breakfast in the Ruins Radio is live on Radio Garden or via the web player at breakfastintheruinsradio.blogspot.com. We have our Patreon page too, and there are a few extra odds and sods on there. But for now, take care, stay safe, and we will meet again soon on the Moonbeam Roads. Mm-hmm.